Well, good evening everybody. Um, back again to carry on with the next part of looking at the um, the article by uh, Steve Drizzen and Richard Leo about um, wrongful convictions involving confessions in the post-DNA era. Um, we left off, um, well I'll just read you the beginning of the paragraph um, this, was, this was at the very end of the previous video. Uh, it said that this article proceeds as follows. Part one discusses from a historical perspective the study of wrongful convictions and the prominent role that false confessions have played in such studies. Part one also discusses the development of DNA testing and its role in renewing interest in the study of wrongful convictions. Part two highlights the connection between police interrogation methods and false confessions, focusing principally on the social psychology of false confessions and research on the causes and consequences of false confessions. Part three discusses the methodology used to compile and analyse the false confessions that make up this article's cohort, defines critical terms and discusses the limitations of the data. Part four, part four sets forth the quantitative findings gleaned from the cohort and part five takes a more qualitative approach to the data set highlighting some of the common themes and trends that emerge from the cohort cases and describing illustrative cases in some detail. Finally, part six concludes this article with several police recommendations suggested by the aforementioned findings and highlights some recent positive developments which suggest that reforms designed to reduce reduce the frequency of false confessions may stand a better chance of being implemented now than ever before. So this is part one. The role of false confession in the study of wrongful conviction. The study of miscarriages of justice, i.e. wrongful conviction in America, You have gone. In America begins with Edwin Borchard's pioneering book, Convicting the Innocent. Arguing against the conventional wisdom that innocent people are never convicted in the American criminal justice system, Borchard detailed 65 convictions in which innocent individuals were wrongfully prosecuted, convicted and incarcerated. The thrust of Borchard's then pioneering, pioneering research was to shift the wrongful, sorry, to shift the research, research question away from whether factually innocent individuals, individuals were wrongfully convicted in the American criminal system to the questions of why they were wrongfully convicted and what can be done to remedy the problem. Borchard identified a number of causes of wrongful conviction, e.g., we know about this one, eyewitness misidentification. We know about this one, perjured testimony, and police and prosecutorial misconduct. Well, three out of three there as well as policy solutions to, to reduce the frequency of wrongful convictions. Um, subsequent empirical studies of error in the administration of criminal justice have elaborated on the multiple causes of wrongful conviction first identified by Borchard. In all of these studies, the problem of false confession has been featured prominently as one among many of the leading causes of wrongful conviction. As discussed in more depth below, however, 
More recent studies have identified false confession as the leading or primary cause of wrongful conviction in anywhere from 14 to 25 percent of the sample cases study. To a large extent, Borchard's pioneering study laid down the template, template that subsequent empirical studies of miscarriages of justice would follow for many years, years to come. From the time Borchard published his book in the early 1930s until the advent of DNA testing in the late 1980s, there was typically one book or major article published every decade or so on the subject of miscarriages of justice, often following the same general format and repeating the same arguments, but with newer and sometimes even more compelling cases. Although Borchard identified 65 cases of wrongful conviction, his book was primarily descriptive rather than analytical. Borchard briefly described how the error occurred, how it was later discovered, and how the original case against the innocent defendant subsequently unravelled. However, Borchard did not quantify, tabulate, or systematically analyse the causes of error in the cases he studied. Similarly, Earl Stanley Gardner's The Court of Last Resort, um, Jerome and Barbara Frank's Not Guilty, and uh, S. Radhakrishnan's The Innocence, all follow the same format as Borchard's classic, documenting and describing cases in which the state mistakenly prosecuted, convicted and incarcerated the wrong man. In all three works, the sp specific causes of wrongful conviction, including the problem of false confession, are discussed in relation to the cases that are presented, but the authors make no attempt to quantify or systematically study the number and characteristics of false confessions or other errors that they describe. Until the late 1980s, there was no systematic social scientific study of the causes, patterns and consequences of miscarriages of justice in America. This changed with Hugo Bedeau and Michael Radlett's 1987 watershed study, Miscarriages of Justice in Potentially Capital Cases, published in the Stanford Law Review. Identifying 350 cases of wrongful conviction in potentially capital cases in America from 1900 to 1987. Bedeau and Radlett systematically analysed the causes of these errors, the sources of discovery of the error and the number of innocents who had been executed. Significantly, Bado and Radlett's sample found that false confessions played a casual role in 49 of the 350 miscarriages of justice studied approximately 14% of the cases in their sample. Badeau and Radlett's article has been influential for a number of reasons. Most fundamentally, it introduced the largest and most compelling data set on wrongful convictions into the literature that at least 350 individuals have been wrongfully convicted of capital crimes in the 20th century is highly disturbing, if not downright horrifying. Moreover, approximately 90% of the 350 wrongful convictions that Badeau and Radlett documented were based on official declarations of innocence. Thus, even if one disputes Badeau and Radlett's conclusion in any particular case, it would be difficult to meaningfully dispute the larger pattern of their findings. Badeau and Radlett have influenced numerous others to research and write about 
the causes and concerns of wrongful conviction. They have inspired others to reanalyse and extend the insights offered by their data. And they have continued to collect, analyse and publish studies of wrongful convictions in capital cases. Following Badeau and Radlett's widely cited Stanford Law Review article, the 1990s were a period of renewed energy and activism in the study of miscarriages of justice. Unlike in the preceding six decades, journalists, lawyers and scholars published a number of books in the 1990s on the problem of wrongful prosecution and conviction, signalling a new and deepening interest in the study of miscarriages of justice. To be sure, most of the articles and books published in the 1990s were in the Borchard tradition of case description and policy prescription, or alternatively, were individual case studies. Nonetheless, these works created an emerging and expanding critical mass in the study of wrongful conviction, calling attention to the old issues in new ways, or at least with newer cases, and laying the groundwork for the biggest and potentially most significant development yet in the academic study of miscarriages of justice. The most significant development in wrongful conviction scholarship in the 1990s was the advent of increasingly sophisticated forms of DNA testing and the application of this new technology to criminal investigation, particularly in post-conviction cases, in which a defendant had long claimed his conviction was erroneous and there remained biological evidence from the crime with which to completely test the convicted person prisoner's claim. Well, we know of one person that fits that bill perfectly, don't we? A certain Mr Avery. DNA testing has established the fact of wrongful conviction in scores of cases, including capital cases. The earliest statement of DNA's testing's ability to conclusively establish the fact of wrongful conviction was contained in Edward Connors, Thomas Lundgren, Neil Miller and Tom McEwen's study of 28 wrongful convictions in which the testing of DNA evidence subsequently established the incarcerated prisoner's innocence. In this study, approximately 18%, that's 5 out of 28, of the convictions were attributable to false confessions. In the eight years since the publication of the Connors study, DNA stud testing has become increasingly sophisticate, sophisticated and numerous other wrongfully convicted individuals have been exonerated, declared innocent and released from prison. Barry Sheck and Peter Newfeld, co-founders of the Innocence Project at the Cardo Cardoza School of Law and others, have continued to work on cases in which DNA testing has established factual innocence and led to the release of wrongfully convicted prisoners. As of the year 2000, when Sheck and Neufeld, along with New York Times journalist Jim Dwyer, published Actual Innocence, Five Days to Execution and Other Dispatches from the Wrongfully convict Convicted, 62 factually innocent individuals have been exonerated by DNA evidence. Of those cases, approximately 24%, 15 out of 62, involved false confessions. At the time of this writing, 140 wrongfully convicted prisoners have been exonerated and released as a result of DNA testing. Approximately 25%, 35 out of 140 of those wrongful convictions were caused by false confessions. The advent of DNA testing and the window it opened into the errors of the legal system has permanently altered the nature and study of miscarriages of justice in America. Most importantly, DNA testing has established factual innocence with certainty 
in numerous post-conviction cases, so much so that it has now become widely accepted in the space of just a few years that wrongful convictions occur with regular and troubling frequency in the American justice system, despite our high-minded ideals and the numerous constitutional rights that are meant to procedurally safeguard the innocent against wrongful conviction. It is one thing for Bordeaux and Radlett to argue, based on their own judgment of the totality of the facts and documentary record in individual cases, that hundreds of innocent individuals have been wrongfully convicted and incarcerated. It is quite another thing for DNA testing to establish prisoners' factual innocence in case after case, notwithstanding judgments of innocence from criminal justice and or political officials. The former can always be disputed and impunged as, as the subjective inter interpretation of the scholar. The latter can be established conclusively and beyond dispute, more so though more so than at any time since Borchard's seminal book in 1932. The advent of DNA testing in the 1990s has established the problem as not whether or how frequently miscarriages of justice occur, but why they occur so frequently and what can be done to prevent and remedy them. As we have seen from this cursory review of the miscarriages of justice literature, only a few studies have systematically aggregated, quantified and analysed the casual role of false confession in wrongful conviction cases. These studies report that the number of false confessions range from 8 to 25% of the total, total miscarriages of justice study, thus establishing the problem of false confession as a leading cause of the wrongful convictions of the innocent in America. Table 1 below lists these studies. If we remove the findings from one methodic, methodologically flawed and otherwise questionable study, the percentage of false confession in the miscarriages of justice studies range from 14 to 25 percent. Um, we'll hold it there and I'll discuss Table 1 the percentage of wrongful confessions in prior studies of wrongful convictions in our next episode. Bye for now.